Hi, I'm Prithvi Bose, uh, uh, one of the faculty uh, in the Department of Leukemia at MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. And uh, I recently uh, spoke uh, at the eighth annual SOHO meeting on uh, the approach to a young woman with a thrombocytosis uh, as part of one of the MPN sessions, so with an obvious focus on essential uh, thrombocythemia. So, when faced with a patient, uh, 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 as stated in the title, uh, a young woman or a young man with uh, thrombocytosis, uh, uh, you know, that comes to a leukemia uh, specialist or an oncologist, obviously you are thinking of the uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, but you want to be uh, certain that you rule out other things. So very important to consider CML, uh, uh, you know, uh, BCR-ABL positive CML can uh, present just with thrombocytosis. Certain forms of uh, uh, MDS-MPN overlap syndromes like, uh, uh, you know, MDS-MPN RST, uh, that can have thrombocytosis. Uh, and then, of course, the classic MPNs, not just ET, but also primary myelofibrosis, polycythemia vera, can all present with, with thrombocytosis. Uh, patients with MDS and the 5Q uh, deletion, isolated 5Q deletion, can have high platelet counts, but usually they have normal, high normal platelet counts and not so much thrombocytosis. Uh, but just important to think about the differential and kind of look at uh, other entities. Now, the ones I mentioned obviously are other malignancies, but you can, of course, have autoimmune diseases, infections, uh, inflammatory conditions, iron deficiency is a big one that can cause thrombocytosis. So uh, 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 th this is sort of a, a summary of my talk in a nutshell. So uh, uh, I did go over the uh, WHO uh, diagnostic criteria and the differentiation of ET from pre-fibrotic primary myelofibrosis, which has become a really important uh, 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 quote unquote new entity in, in, in recent years. Uh, first recognized in 2008 and then now officially incorporated in 2016 into the WHO criteria. And the importance of that distinction because prefibrotic primary myelofibrosis is a more serious condition than ET with worse outcomes and, 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 uh, uh, and, and more aggressive uh, clinical features uh, such as uh, a higher bleeding risk, for example, but more importantly, worse survival, higher rates of uh, progression to overt uh, myelofibrosis and AML. Um, and then I went over the general, uh, uh, you know, natural uh, course of ET. Fortunately, this is a disease that is a fairly indolent with a normal or near normal survival. Uh, and then all the driver mutations, we've learned a lot in recent years. Uh, uh, JAK2, MIPL, and CALAR, is, uh, in fact, do not uh, tell the entire story. We are learning about non-canonical JAK2 and MIPL mutations uh, in those that don't have the V617F or the W515L. Uh, we are learning about uh, non-driver mutations, which can help you establish the diagnosis by establishing clonality in patients that do not have the classic uh, drivers. Uh, there is a new prognostic model for ET in 2020 called the MIPS ET uh, that takes into account not just age, leukocytosis, uh, things that we've known about in the past, but also splicing mutations and male gender as being adverse in ET. Uh, there are differences also recognized between CALAR mutated and JAK2 mutated ET that I uh, covered in my talk. These have been extensively published on. Most important really from a management standpoint is the fact that CALAR mutated patients have the lowest risk of thrombosis. And this may also be true for the triple negative patients. Uh, but CALAR mutated patients that are young uh, and have never had a clot actually do not need anything, not even aspirin, they can just be observed. And that is something that is relatively recent in the last few years. Um, uh, we now uh, risk stratify our ET patients according to what's called the revised Ipset thrombosis uh, score, uh, something that the NCCN guidelines uh, endorse. There are four categories, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. 
and the management really differs according to these categories. It's the high risk that absolutely requires hyperreductive therapy. The low and intermediate may not, uh, and the very low do not. Uh, and in fact, like I just said, they can just be observed. Uh, aspirin, of course, is important for all the categories other than the very low risk. Um, and then white counts are gaining more and more uh, uh, importance. Uh, They're not formally, uh, leukocytosis is not formally a risk stratification factor yet, but a number of studies have shown the importance of leukocytosis as a, a risk factor for thrombosis and definitely for poorer survival and higher rates of leukemic transformation. And that applies uh, generally to PV as well. And finally, closing out with all the treatments, uh, as is well known, hydroxyurea is by far the most commonly used frontline cytoreductive drug around the world. Enegrolide uh, in one study was non-inferior, but there were important uh, study design differences between that study and the landmark PT1 study that established hydroxyurea as the frontline drug of choice. That's important to be aware of. Uh, more recently, we had the MPN Research Consortium study looking at pegylated interferon versus hydroxyurea in the frontline in high-risk PV and PT, and that study showed absolutely no difference between the two treatments at two years. Uh, finally, um, uh, is there uh, room for new drugs? Uh, is there, uh, are there unmet needs? Well, yes. Symptoms are not well addressed by any of the drugs I just mentioned, and that is where ruxolitinib could have a role. Um, it is being developed currently uh, for the most part in patients with hydroxyurea resistant or intolerant ET for which there exist criteria, just like there are for PV. Uh, and those formal criteria are there and help in the trial design. Unfortunately, the US trial of ruxolitinib could not accrue well and had to be stopped. Again, that was a second line trial for hydroxyurea failures. It was versus anegrolide. Uh, but there are other trials uh, ongoing around the world. And this is important, not just because of symptoms, but also because hydroxyurea resistance in ET portends a worse outcome in terms of survival. Uh, so that is important to recognize as well. There was a uh, randomized investigator initiated trial in England uh, uh, of, of ruxolitinib versus best available therapy in the, in the post hydroxyurea or hydroxyurea failure setting that was unfortunately negative, except for symptomatic benefit. And that is most, uh, mostly it uh, as far as uh, uh, what I covered in the talk. There are some new drugs uh, uh, that are being looked at, but there's no data available yet. We have the new ROPEG interferon alpha 2b, that's the very long acting interferon recently approved in Europe for PV. That's going to be studied in ET. There's also the BH3 mimetic navetoclax and the LSD1 inhibitor bomidemstat. These, are, uh, have, uh, these have been studied in myelofibrosis and will be studied in ET. Uh, and there were some others in the past uh, that had been studied in ET, things like imitalstat and givinostat that are not being studied for ET at the current time. 